Hello and welcome to this 90 minute live Q&A call with Bob Proctor that we're calling Good News. I'm Mikey Stiller and I'll be your host. Right now, the whole world is looking at this as a very tough time. And for some, it certainly is. But you know, perception can change everything. And as bad as this may be, there's a, there is as much or more good that can be found within it. Bob has been studying this since 1961. He's been through the thick and thin of life. If you don't think he's had problems, you're kidding yourself. He has had his share of obstacles and adversity, and he's always come out on top. He's the best in the world at what he does, the best in the world at teaching us how to think, how to get the results we want in our life, and how to use our higher faculties to get there. He's been at this for 59 years. He's helped businesses increase their revenue by hundreds of millions of dollars in all kinds of economies. He's one of the highest paid speakers in the world, and odds are he's going to get, have an answer to your question. He's not going to give a flippant answer. He's going to tell you what he absolutely knows. So now I'm going to introduce you to the chairman and co-founder of the Proctor Gallagher Institute so he can share some good news throughout this 90 minute Q&A session. Here is Bob Proctor. Well, thank you, Mikey. Hi, Bob, how are you? I'm doing wonderful. I think I should mention that Mikey Steller started with us I think she was working as a nanny when she came to work for us. Had no business experience at all. Today, she's our marketing director and chief operating officer. Very, very successful lady. Doing a great job. When do you, how long have you been with us, Mikey? 11 and a half years. 11 and a half years. You count the half, do you? <laughs> I do. All right, well, let's get going, Mikey. <laughs> All right, I've got a lot of questions here. We've got thousands of people watching. Questions are coming in pretty quickly, so let's get through as many as we can. Good. And the first and probably most asked question is this. What are your thoughts on the coronavirus or COVID-19? Well, I'm not quite sure what you mean. What are my thoughts on it? Um, I don't understand it. I can only go by what the scientists tell us. It's a, uh, it's a terrible thing, there's no question about it, for anybody that is impacted by it. The whole world is being impacted by it one way or another. Um, but I don't understand it. I don't understand why it's happening. Um, I just know it's happening. And I go, by, um, I go by something Michael Beckwith taught me probably 10 years ago. And he, um, he was speaking on a program that I was speaking on. We were working together. And he said something, he broke it down into three parts. You want to remember this. I've used it many, many times, and I've shared it with millions of people. When anything happens, and this could fall into that category, when anything happens, there's a three-step approach. Number one, it is what it is, accept it. It's either going to control you or you're going to control it. Number two, harvest the good. There's something good in everything. And may be difficult to understand at times, but it's still true. Harvest the good. And number three, forgive all the rest. You and I cannot do anything to change what's going on outside of us, but we can change our perception of it. We can change our point of view. And I think what we have to understand is that nothing is bad or good except our thinking makes it so. Ralph Waldo Trine wrote a great book. And in that, he explained that. Nothing is good or bad except our thinking makes it so. Everything is. And then we make it what it is. I, um, I got a, a quote this morning that I thought was incredible. Let me find it. I want to share it with you. This is by Nicole Reed. I don't know Nicole, but I love this quote. Sometimes bad things happen in our lives, put us directly on the... Some things, sometimes bad things that happen in our lives put us directly on a path to the most wonderful things that will ever happen to us. Now, I've lived long enough, I think you've lived long enough to know that, that that's true. As far as the virus, I don't know why it's happening. 
I do know it's happening. I choose to look for the good, and there's got a lot of good going to come out of this. Next question there, Mikey. This next question, when you say you can respond to a situation or react to a situation, what do you mean and how can we use that right now? Well, respond and react, that, that's a very good point. Um, when something happens and you react, somebody says something or, I don't know, maybe you get cut off in your car, you lose something. When something happens and you react to it, that something or someone is in control of your emotions. When you react to a situation, the situation is in control of you. When you respond to the situation, you stay in control. Um, it's a simple concept. It's just not that easy to execute. But you can get good at it. In fact, you can get very good at it. So when anything happens, you respond, you stay in control. You react, you give your power, you give control of the situation. This next question, how can we use these times to create our own economy? Well, do you know, I've been studying success now my whole adult life. And I, um, as you see, I've got a beautiful library here. I have another, this is in our studio. I have another one in the house. And there's just one story after another about how success really came out of one of the worst things that ever happened. When something happens, we must understand this whole universe operates by law. And at times like this, you may have a difficult time believing that, but nevertheless, it's true. I think Warner Von Braun put it very well. He said the natural laws of this universe are so precise that we don't have any difficulty building spaceships, sending people to the moon, and you can time the landing by the precision of a fraction of a second. He also said that after studying the spectacular mysteries of the cosmos for his whole life, he come to the firm belief in the existence of God. The law is God's modus operandi. It's how everything happens. Well, one of the laws is the law of opposite. That law decrees if it's a short way up onto this desk, it's only a short way down. If it's a long way up, it's a long way down. If something's very bad, the opposite side of it, it's very good. It's equal and opposite. There's something very good going to come out of this. Now, we may not see it in our lifetime. Then again, we might. But something good will come out of it. If you believe in the law, if you believe in God, I do believe in God. And I do believe that God operates in a very exact way. Like winter never follows winter. When the tide goes out, it always comes back. These are laws. Well, there's laws that govern the whole universe. And they're exact. One of them is the law of opposites. Bob, this next question is, I feel consumed by worry and panic. How can I shift my thinking when people are losing their jobs, getting sick, and even dying? Well, <laughs> you're into something pretty heavy here. First of all, we almost all operate in the premise that death is a bad thing. Death and birth are the same thing. They're transitions. You moved into your body, you will move out of your body. All science and all theology are very, very clear on one point. That nothing is created or destroyed. If nothing's created or destroyed, that just postulates the theory of life. There's no such thing as death. There is a transition. You moved into your body, you will move out of your body. Um, You can't do anything um, about what's going on outside. You can only do control what's going on inside. You've got to be the best example you can be. Our company's involved and has been now for almost 60 years, involved in helping people understand themselves, 
understand the laws of their being and understand how to stay in harmony with the law and move in the right direction. Now that doesn't mean you're not going to have bad things happen. Bad things will happen. I've had bad things. I could ruin your week if I told you some of the things that have happened. But I've always survived them. I've come out on the other end. And I believe if we keep our attitude in the right direction, we're going to come out of this okay. I really believe that. Worry is actually praying for what you do not want. I want you to think. Prayer is the movement that takes place between spirit and form with and through us. It's when we go to an infinite power to God and ask. We build an image in our mind. That image, by holding it in our mind, must move into form. That's the perpetual transportation of energy. That's one of the laws of the universe. When we worry, we are putting ourselves into a vibration that we have to be in to attract whatever it is we're thinking about. Worry causes fear. Fear sets up a physical thing as anxiety. We suppress the anxiety and turns into depression. We're on a bad track when we're worrying. What we want to do is stop and think. Hold the image of what we want, not what we don't want. Okay? This next question, what are some mindset tips for people whose work or industry might be on pause right now? Do you want to repeat that, please, Mikey? What are some mindset tips for people whose work or industry is on pause right now? Well, you know, I have been, well, first of all, I started to read this book. This is Think and Grow Rich. I started to read this book. Um, on October the 21st, 1961. I've never stopped reading it. The book is literally falling apart. Uh, this book is the composite of the best thinking of 500 of um, some of the most successful people that have ever lived. Napoleon Hill spent his entire life gathering the information um, and then putting it in an organized manner for anybody that wants to study it. I've studied it my whole adult life. And this led me to study in other books and study in other programs. And it's a strange thing, but when times get tough, most people stop studying. That's when they should really pour the coals on. I, um, I'm generally here in my studio very early in the morning, and that's where I start. I start studying, I start writing out 10 things I'm grateful for every morning. You've got phenomenal teachers all over the world now teaching this information. You've got self-help books that um, are the top of the bestseller list today. So if a person feels like their life's on hold, you've let somebody else put it on hold. You don't have to put it on hold. You may realize that you're in a transition right now. Start to look for the good in it. Start to think. It's the highest function we're capable of. Earl Nightingale said something interesting one time. He says, thinking, um, he said, if most people said what they were thinking, they would be speechless. Most people don't think. And you may say, well, that sounds a little silly. But if you listen to what people are saying, it's going to be fairly obvious they're not thinking, or they would never say what they're saying. Stand back and watch the way people behave, and it's fairly obvious they're not thinking, or they'd never do what they're doing. If you think your life's on hold, it's because you put it on hold. Nobody else can put my life on hold. The only one that can put my life on hold is me. And... Uh, I did that often. In fact, it was almost on perpetual hold prior to me reading this book, and I was 26. I mean, I was just like a cork in the ocean, bouncing around, always ending up going nowhere. When I started to read this, at that time, I did something. I wrote a goal on a card. I've carried a goal card in my pocket ever since. And 
That's what everybody needs. If you feel your life's on hold, you don't have a goal. Set a goal. Sit down, set a goal. And then just think of how you can reach it and don't spend five seconds of thinking of why you can't. Understand this. No one but yourself can put your life on hold. Don't permit anybody else to do it. Next one there, Mikey. This next one, should I continually focus my thoughts on my goals or just visualize them on a regular basis or just let go and let God? Will I still be on the same frequency either way? Well, <laughs> I don't sit and spend all my time thinking of my goal. I have a goal in the card. I've got a little wishing well here that Lori gave to me. And in it is a goal. It's written there. I've had this on my desk for quite a while. Um, I don't sit and dwell on my goal, but that's what I'm working towards. Everything I'm doing is to take me towards the goal. Goals are not to, are not to get. Goals are designed to grow, get you to reach, to go higher than you've ever gone, go after something you've never done before, run faster than you've ever run, sell more than you've ever sold, jump higher than you've ever jumped. And um, that's what goals are for. Goals are to grow. So. You set the goal and that's the target, and then you just keep thinking of what you can do to get there. And ideas will start to come to you and you act on the ideas. Okay. What five books would you recommend besides Think and Grow Rich and Science of Getting Rich? Five others? Hmm. Yeah. Well, As a Man Thinketh is a classic by James Allen. There's another one, U Square by Price Pritchett. I believe it's one of the best books I've ever read. It's a little book, but it's a classic. U Square by Price Pritchett. Um, there's a book, it's out of print, but you can get it because I just got another copy. It's called um, The Technique of Getting Things Done by Donald and Eleanor Laird. The Technique of Getting Things Done. They wrote a number of technique books. It was, it's, it's an old book, but it's, it's an incredible book. And um, the Bible, read the Bible. It's the greatest sales manual that was ever written. Um, they're just the ones that come to my mind right now. Thanks, Bob. This next question. Well, Can we uh, Mikey, safeguard our Mikey, hold on a minute. Yeah. Uh, take, take a book I've written, You Were Born Rich. And the truth is you were born rich. Most people are just a little short of money. Everybody's born rich. You have deep reservoirs of talent and ability within you. If you go to our website, just go to proctorgallagher.com and you will find somewhere on there, you can download You Were Born Rich. It's free. Get it and read it. I wrote that in uh, 1984, but what I did, I had earned well over a million dollars long before that, but I chronicled each step that I had taken, and it's all in an orderly manner. I followed Napoleon Hill's recipe for organizing information and then intelligently directing it. So you can go on the, go on the site and get it and download it free. You were born rich. I love it. This next question, can we safeguard ourselves from the virus by using the law of attraction? Well, <laughs> you've got to understand, first of all, what the law of attraction is. You're a mass of energy. Uh, you're a mass of energy and a very high speed of vibration. And it's the images you hold in your mind that dictate the vibration this instrument that we're living in is in. The, vibe, the body is a mo molecular structure and it's in a high speed of vibration. The only thing you can attract to you is that which vibrates in harmony with you. See, the idea of law of attraction and goals, law of attraction is a secondary law. The primary law is the law of vibration. That's the one you want to study. The law of vibration decrees everything moves, nothing rests. Everything. The walls around you are moving. They may appear to be still, but they are not still. They're moving. Take a microscope and look at 
the wall through the microscope, you'll see it moving. Pick up the remains in a coffin, a body. Look at it. That body is not dead. It is moving. And if it wasn't moving, how would it ever change to dust? So you move according to the way you think. The thoughts you think and the thoughts that are programmed into your subconscious mind control the vibration you're in. It's the vibration you're in that dictates what you attract to you. If you hold an image of perfect health and just see yourself as being very healthy, vibrant and alive, and hold that image, that's very likely the way you're going to live. There's, um, what book is it in? I think it's in a book, J. Martin Coey. He wrote a book, Your Greatest Power. Your greatest power is your power to choose. And I believe the stories in J. Martin Coey's book about a, a group in England during the First World War. They went through the entire war, an entire battalion of people, of soldiers, not one of them were wounded, none of them were killed. Together, they would repeat the um, prayer of protection from the Bible every day. And by doing that, they put themselves into the right vibration. And they stayed very healthy. So there's all kinds of stories like this around. But what we've got to understand is everything's happening by law, even this virus. Now, why it's happening, I don't know. But I do know this. It's not an accident. There are no accidents. Everything's by law. And so we have to understand that this is happening for a reason. I have absolutely no idea what the reason would be, and I may never have it. May, you may not. But that does not negate the idea that it is an orderly universe that we're a part of. It does operate by law. And there is something good about it. This next question, what do I do if I set goals and I'm not disciplined enough to complete them? <laughs> well, you're halfway there. You recognize the problem. Um, I would recommend that you um, form the habit of being disciplined. I see discipline as one of my strongest, strongest strengths, and it never used to be. It was a great weakness of mine. I just wasn't disciplined. Um, I started studying this book, and he talks about persistence. There's a chapter in here on persistence, and it's, there's one part here, in fact, I was reading it this morning. He says, there's no substitute for persistence. It cannot be, cannot be supplanted by any other quality. Remember this, and it will hearten you in the beginning when the going may seem difficult and slow. Now, this part is very fitting. Those who have cultivated the habit of persistence seem to enjoy insurance against failure. No matter how many times they are defeated, they finally arrive up towards the top of the ladder. Sometimes it appears that there is a hidden guide whose duty is to test us through all sorts of discouraging experiences. Those who pick themselves up after defeat and keep on trying arrive and the world cries, bravo, I knew you could do it. But the hidden guide lets no one enjoy great success without passing the persistence test. Those who can't take it simply don't make the grade. Now, discipline is the ability to give yourself a command and follow it. If you lack discipline, make up your mind you're going to make it one of your strongest, one of the strongest parts of your character. And start with anything. Give yourself a command and then do it. Doesn't matter what it is. I don't care if it's cleaning up your room if it's keeping your desk tidy, whatever it is. Discipline is the ability to give yourself a command and follow it. Now, if you're giving up on your goals, odds are pretty good you're not setting them properly in the first place. First of all, a goal should be something you really want and you have no idea how to get it. If you know how to get it, you're probably going sideways. There's no growth. When you're going after something, you have no idea how to get it. You're going ahead. It's an upward climb. 
When John Kennedy asked Dr. Warner Von Braun what it would take to build a rocket that would carry a person to the moon and bring him back safely to Earth, he answered him in five words. He said, the will to do it. The will is what gives you the ability to hold one idea on the screen of the mind to the exclusion of all the side distractions. So your goal has to be something you really want. And then discipline yourself to see yourself getting it and you keep doing. Everything you're doing is to move you towards that. Make up your mind to develop discipline as one of your greatest characteristics. Okay. This next question, what is the purpose of life and how can I turn my passion into purpose? Well, the purpose of life is growth. And purpose of life is to become aware of your oneness with God. We are created in God's image. I think we've created a problem for ourselves, though, because we created God in our image instead of understanding that we're created in God's image. And God is always for expansion and fuller expression, always for growth. So our purpose is to become, grow and become aware of our oneness with God. The purpose of our company is to live and work in a prosperous environment that encourages productivity and pleasure so that we may improve the service we render to our family, our company, our community, our nation, and ultimately the world. You've got to have a purpose. Your purpose is why you get out of bed in the morning. Your purpose is why you do anything. That's why, like, I frequently have people give me um, opportunities or offer me opportunities. And at one time, I used to spend a lot of time looking at them because I get somebody offering me a number of them every day. And I used to spend a lot of time looking at them until one day I was realizing I was making a mistake. And... I just quickly analyze, is it on purpose for me? If it's not on purpose, then I don't care if I could earn a lot of money. I don't care what it is. I'm not interested in. Everything you do should be on purpose. Your goals should be on purpose. Our purpose is to live and work in a prosperous environment that encourages productivity and pleasure. And I want to help everybody do the same thing. So your purpose is why you get up. It's why you're living. So your purpose is why you're living, then you have a vision. In fact, um, Mikey, you can figure out how to get this to anybody that's online. I've written a paper called Purpose, Vision, and Goals. The purpose is why you're living. Your vision then is a long range view of a multiplicity of things that you want to accomplish, all of which would be on purpose. So it's like a funnel going out and you see all these different things you want to accomplish that are on purpose. Your goal is like taking a bite out of that funnel. The goal is the one you're going after right now. So you have purpose, vision, and goals. The purpose is why you're living. Your vision is where you're going or the things you want to accomplish. And your goal is what you're working on right now to move you in that direction. Well, we've written a paper on There's some way we can get that. I don't know. Yep, we've got our team. They're going to add a download link to the description on both YouTube and Facebook. So check back right here on you. wherever you're watching this and Thank we'll you. add a link to download. Okay. You know, I mentioned okay. earlier, Mikey, next question. Uh, Mikey, I mentioned earlier that now is the time when you want to double down on your studying. I was talking to Arash Vasagi. He's Arash is one of the greatest salesmen in the world. He's our vice president of sales. And he and I are great friends and have been for a long time. And I was talking to him this morning and he was pointing that out. He said, when time gets tough, you should multiply what you're putting into your goals, into your study. You know, the time and money you spend on building yourself. This is very important and most people don't understand it. You don't back off studying in tough times. You really pour the coals to it. That's how you get through the tough times. I remember um, Robert Schuler from Crystal Cathedral, who's gone now, God bless him, but he did help a lot of people. 
He said, tough times never last. Tough people do. I love that. I think that was the title of a book that he wrote. Tough times never last. Tough people do. You've got to get out there and you've got to give it your best. Um, we, we do a lot of coaching, a lot of helping in the, in the seminars we conduct to really help people get going. If you feel stuck, um, how would it be, uh, Mikey, if put something up, if anybody wants a, a personal coaching of 30 minutes or so, uh, one of our, have one of our coaches call them and talk to them and help them, show them, you know, how to get unstuck. Um, it would be free, you know, just a free coaching lesson. I think it would help a lot of people that may be listening. What's the next Absolutely. question there, Mikey? We'll add that link to the description as well. Well, that leads into the next question quite perfectly. This next question is, how do I distract my mind from negative things and protect and maintain my positive mindset? Well, you're going to distract your mind from the negative thing by focusing on its polar opposite. Do whatever you have to do. If you have to sit down and write out a hundred times, I'm so happy and grateful now that I'm locked into my goal. I'm so happy and grateful now that I'm mentally locked into my goal. I'm so happy and grateful now that I'm mentally locked into my goal. I'll tell you something else to do that I do all the time. I carry a card in my pocket to write down things I want to do. And on this card is the last chapter in As a Man Thinketh. It's called Serenity. You might put this on line two, Mike, uh, for anybody to download. Listen, calmness of mind is one of the beautiful jewels of wisdom. It's the result of long and patient effort in self-control. Its presence is an indication of ripened experience and of a more than ordinary knowledge of the laws and operations of thought. This, this is two pages of the most phenomenal literature you'll ever read on serenity. Calmness of mind is one of the beautiful jewels of wisdom. And so it is. If you're having trouble in these times right now, get this, put that, and have anybody be able to download that, Mikey, and write it out every day. Remember Kathy Gallagher, who's one of the coachings in our company, and she does a phenomenal job. She wrote that out every day for 90 days. And when it was finished, she did it for another 90, and she's done that two or three times over the past few years. And there was a marked difference in her personality, and she'd be quick to tell you, it literally changed our life. It changed anybody's life. I've done it myself. It's powerful. Writing causes thinking. The repetition of writing things impresses it upon the subconscious mind. And that's really where you want to put the, the effort. Get it plugged into your subconscious. What's the next one there, Mikey? I keep getting a certain idea and I feel so excited with it. Should I act upon it? Is that a sign to fulfill it? Or should I stay focused on my C-type goal? I would act on it. That doesn't, have, that doesn't mean that you have to be distracted from your goal. Listen, you can have a lot of different goals. Um, your C-type goal is the one, that's the big one. That's the one I've got in here. That's the one that I've got written on my goal card that I carry in my pocket. But there's a number of things I'm doing. A number of things I'm doing. Um, like, it was only, was it yesterday or the day before, I thought of doing this. I thought, you know, there's all kinds of people that are stuck with information. I think I'll do a Q&A call and do it for the public, not just our own people but for the public at large. So we put it on YouTube and on Facebook and everything. Um, this is something that we had to organize, we had to put together very fast. I'm gonna do another thing for our own company, just for members of our own company and our consultants um, tomorrow, but we haven't notified them of it yet. And it's a special project I'm working on. I'm working on a number of different projects. And I keep working on these projects all the time. They're helping me move towards the goal. If you've got an idea that keeps coming to your mind, get, write it down and do it. Act on it. Okay? This next question, what habit should I focus on developing to stay on track with my goals? 
Well, it's not just a habit, it's a, it's a mental faculty. You're going to, um, let me see, I think I've got this thing set so I can do this. Um, you have physical factors. You can see, hear, smell, taste, and touch, okay? They are your physical faculties. You have mental faculties. You have perception, the will, reason, imagination, memory, and intuition. Now, unfortunately, the mental faculties, we learn very little about. The physical faculties, from the time we're little kids, will you listen to what I'm telling you? Will you look at what I'm showing you? It's hammered into our mind. That's why we live from the outside in. We live through our senses. We should be using our higher faculties. Um, Einstein said that these were mental gifts, and they are. Perception, the will, reason, intuition, uh, imagination, uh, memory, and intuition. Now, what was the question again? What habits should you be focused on? I think it was. What was yes, that question? To stay on track with the goals. Yeah. Okay. What habit should I focus on? Yeah. Okay. It's not necessarily a habit, or you could form the habit. The will is the mental faculty that gives you the ability to concentrate. There's a power. Look at it this way. Let's say here's your mind, and here's your body. This is your conscious mind. This is your subconscious mind. Now, there's a power flowing into your consciousness. And when that power flows in, you can do whatever you want with it. What we want to learn to do is mentally use this higher faculty, the will. How do we do that? We understand that it's one of these higher faculties. We build one idea on the screen of our mind from this power. And you hold that idea. This is our emotional mind. You get emotionally involved with that idea. Now, as you do that, you lock yourself physically into that vibration. So there's a power flowing into your consciousness. On a conscious level, you can do anything you want with it. That's where reason comes in. Reason gives you the ability to choose. I am going to choose an idea something I want to stay locked into. I'm going to get emotionally involved. I'm going to turn that already over my subconscious mind. When I do that, I'm physically getting locked into. Now, the will gives me the ability to focus, to concentrate on that. When you concentrate, you increase the amplitude of vibration. This power is flowing to and through you. Um, the golfer has to concentrate. And I remember when The Secret first came out, I got onto a plane. I was sitting in 1B. Another man got on and sat on 2A, which was behind me against the wall. And after we got in the air, he reached over and touched me on the shoulder. He said, I think you could help me. I said, well, if I can, I will. He said, you're Bob Proctor. And I said, yes. He said, I'm a pro golfer. I'm on my way to New York for the, uh, the tournament. And he said, I said, I could probably help you a lot. So anyway, he and I got together. And I was teaching him to concentrate. I said, take, now anybody could do this, take and put a dot on a wall opposite your favorite chair. Put a dot in the wall. I said, you can just take with a pen. Nobody will notice it. If they see it, they'll think it's a fly. And then concentrate on that dot. Every time you find your mind wanting to bring it back to the dot. When you learn to concentrate on one thing, you can concentrate on anything. Now think of this. What did, what did Von Braun say to Kennedy? What would it take to build a rocket that will carry a person to the moon and bring it back to the Earth? He said, the will to do it. The ability to hold that idea on the screen of your mind until you accomplish it. The will to do it. The will gives you the ability to concentrate. 
concentration increases amplitude of vibration. It takes and speeds that power up that's flowing through you and you give more energy to it. Emerson said the only thing that can grow is the thing you give energy to. Now, I've wandered around there with a few things, but I think I answered your question. Thanks, Bob. This next question, if the opposite of doubt and worry is knowledge and study, why or how does the study remove this? Re say that again. If the opposite of doubt and worry is knowledge and study, why or how does the study remove this? Okay, well, let's look at that. That's a very important point. Let's move this up. Here. Here is the mind. Here is the body. Art is not my major. <laughs> now, when this power flows in, it just is. It is neither negative or positive. We make it what it is. Two people can be looking at the same thing. One sees something bad, the other sees something good. When you build a negative picture, that's doubt or worry. Now, pay really close attention. This is a powerful lesson. You get emotionally involved with whatever the doubt or the worry is, and that sets up an emotion called fear, because that's the emotional mind. That fear, it's energy that's impressed. It must be expressed through the only instrument it can, the physical body. It sets up a vibration better known as anxiety. The anxiety is not expressed. Anxiety is suppressed. When you see people that are very anxious, they suppress it. They don't talk about it. They keep it locked up inside. That suppression turns to depression. The depression turns to dis-ease. And the dis-ease turns to disintegration. Now that's the negative side. The cause of this is ignorance. Now the opposite of ignorance is knowledge. Everything has an opposite. There's ignorance and knowledge. People don't consciously and deliberately do this. They may deliberately do it, but they're not consciously aware of what they're doing. Ignorance is their problem. In fact, ignorance is our only problem. It's the only problem. It's the cause of all wars. Knowledge, the only way you can get to knowledge is through study. And knowledge through study will give you understanding. Understanding is the opposite of doubt and worry. What do we want to understand? We want to understand that everything has an opposite. If you're looking at the negative side, what you want to understand, there is a positive side. You can focus on that. And as you get emotionally involved in the positive side, that's going to set up an emotion called faith. Now, it's a strange thing. Both faith and fear causing you to believe in something you cannot see. The fear then, is, or the faith then, is expressed in well-being. The well-being is expressed. It's not suppressed. It's expressed then accelerates. And that is because you're at ease, there's no dis-ease. And because you're at ease, it's creation, not disintegration. So you see, there's your two sides of life. And you choose which side you're going to go on. That's why ignorance is the greatest problem we've got. I have people sometimes tell us our programs are expensive. I said, no, our programs aren't expensive. Ignorance is expensive. See, up until I read this book, I struggled. I struggled at everything. As I started to read this, I started to eliminate the struggle. I started to wake up. Do you know that you and I are God's highest form of creation? We're God's highest form of creation. There is nothing that will equal us. Just take that down, Scott, please. Now think of that for a moment. We're God's highest form of creation. No one can even guess at what you and I are capable of doing. What we want to train ourselves to do 
Here's something you want to look at. Let this sand timer represent the time of your life, okay? The sand in the glass represents your life. Now look at this. The sand in the top of the glass represents the future. You don't know how much sand is in the top of the glass. You don't know how much. All you can see is what's in the bottom. You may think you have a lot, you might only have a little. Think. This is gone, this you haven't got yet. The only thing you can focus on is right here, right now. Do you know, when I was a little kid, I chummed around with another young guy named Bob Yates. Bob and I were as thick as thieves. We did everything together as kids. And if you had asked Bob at a certain time one day how much time he had left, he would have said at least a half a century. Bob was more like this. He didn't have a half hour. He was coming in the highway on Kingston Road. He had just got his driver's license. He was only 16, hit the abutment of a bridge. His life was wiped out. Now, when I was a little kid, my grandmother was probably around 60 when the time I was a little guy, when I remember. Grandma would always be saying, she pretty well raised us, I'll soon be gone, dear, I'll soon be gone. Joe, you know, we got to a point where we thought Grandma was never going to go. Now, we didn't want her to go. But Grandma thought she only had a little bit of now, a little bit of time left. She actually had a lot. Bob thought he only had, he thought he had a lot, he only had a little. Here's the point. It's what you've got right here, right now, that makes the difference. Rather than be worried about what's going to happen in the future, let's focus on what we're doing right now. Because that's all we've got. Get our mind on the right track right now. That's all we've got. There is nothing more. It's so simple and yet so misunderstood. What's the next question there, Mikey? This next question, I've lost my source of income. What should I do with my life? Well, I'll tell you something I stumbled on after I started to read this book. I stumbled on a truth that took me from earning $4,000 a year to about $175,000 a year within a year. One of the secrets of wealth is multiple sources of income. If you only have one, you lose it. It's all gone. I would recommend you start to think. Start to study how to earn money. Do you know what's a strange thing? I've got a lot, not a lot of books here on, on money, and none of them are really talking about money. Think and grow rich, but he doesn't talk about money. He talks about you. He talks about your mind, talks about how your mind functions. Money is a reward received for service rendered. If you want to earn more money, you've got to provide more service. Don't feel sorry for yourself. Get excited. Say, I'm at a start over point. I can start from scratch. Don't feel bad because you have no money coming in. Start to think, I'm going to change that. Now, what you want to do is do what I did. I sat down and I wrote on a card that I was going to have in my possession by New Year's of 1970, $25,000. Now, I wrote that in 1961. I didn't believe that would happen. But I'll tell you what I learned. I learned if you write a lie on a card, you read it often enough, you're going to start to believe it. And when you start to believe it, that's when things start to happen. Now, I wrote that I would have $25,000. And the man said, just keep reading that. Keep reading it. Keep reading it. The guy told me to do this. And it, it, he tells you in here, decide what you want, write it on the card. All I wanted was some money. I was unhappy, I was sick, and I was broke. I was earning $4,000, but I owed $6,000. And so he um, said, write it on the card. He says, what do you really want? I said, I want $25,000. Just, I mean, that was like, that's like saying, I want a million. I, I really didn't believe it would happen. He said, write it on the card, read it as often as possible. Now, he also said, if you do exactly what I'm telling you, and I started to do exactly what he told me. I don't know why, because I, I had never done what I was told prior to that. And what happened, now in retrospect, I figured this out. I stopped worrying about debt, and I started to think about earning money. See, prior to doing this, I was worried about debt. All I could think about was debt. People were phoning me, where's the money? I didn't know. I couldn't tell them. And so all I was thinking about was debt. When I started to write this and read it every day, I started to think of earning money. 
One day, I heard a guy say, there's good money cleaning floors. I thought, well, I'm not proud I can clean floors. I started to clean one office. It was Canada's starch office on Comstock Road in Toronto. I washed the floor twice a month, $15 a time, $30. Then I started to clean Kirby's construction on Wicksteed Avenue, I got 65 a month. Now I'm up to 100 a month, an extra 95 a month. That was 25% of what I was earning. Do you know that in under five years, I was cleaning offices in Toronto, Montreal, Boston, Cleveland, Atlanta, and London, England. There was no end to where I could go, what I could do. I started to learn that if I could see it in my head, I could hold it in my hand. Don't feel bad or don't feel sorry for yourself. That is a terrible state to get in. Get excited about yourself. I'm at a start over place. I can start over right now and start thinking. Take a pen and a pad and start to write down ideas. Just any idea that comes to your mind, write them down. There are no silly ideas. Write them down and keep thinking. I guarantee you something will come to your mind. Get thinking, grow rich, and read it. Go to our site. Go to proctorgallagher.com. Download You Were Born Rich. I don't know where it is on there, but down, you'll find it on the site. Download it. It's free. Read it. Read it. And then write, read and write, read and write. Keep thinking how you can do it. You'll come up with some ways to do it. That was when my life changed. Next one, Mikey. This next question is, can you teach us how to use auto-suggestion to create new results during this turbulent time? Say that again, please. Can you teach us how to use auto-suggestion sure. to create new results? Okay. Yeah. Look it. Um, Scott, you need your help here. Where do, how do I clear this? Don't worry about that. Okay. All right. Auto suggestion. Let's look. First, understand that suggestion is the most powerful force there is. What are we doing wrong here, Scott? about being on screen. <laughs> okay, thank you. That's Scott Edwards. He had a goal. He lived in uh, Manchester in England. He watched The Secret when he was 13, made up his mind he wanted to work with me. Scott is the director of our studio today. He can run this from anywhere in the world. We've got multiple cameras in here. We have cameras coming out of the ceiling, multiple cameras. We can broadcast all over the world. It's a miniature television station, and it's, um, Scott knows how to run the whole thing. When he was 13, he set a goal. He prepared himself. He's here. He works in the studio. Now, let's think. Suggestion is the most powerful force there is. There is nothing more powerful. That's how television operates, through suggestion from advertising. Suggestion. Now, what you're trying to do is get an idea. It's auto-suggestion. It's where you are going to create an idea here in your conscious mind. There's a good book. What do you say when you talk to yourself? Um, the heck is his name? Um, the author's name will come to me. You just, what do you say when you talk to yourself is the name of the book? Well, it's all on auto-suggestion. You're talking to yourself, you're giving a suggestion all the time. Build a positive picture, an idea in your conscious mind. This is your emotional mind. Let yourself get emotionally involved in the idea. There's a wonderful book. Um, 
The Art of Acting by Stella Adler. And Stella Adler was one of the greatest acting teachers. She studied under, I think his name was Stanislavski, the Russian acting teacher who um, originated method acting. But anyway, Stella Adler studied with him, and then she was a great acting teacher in America. She's gone now, and she never wrote a book, but a man named Kissel took all her lessons and put them in a book. And it's a great book to study. William James in Harvard, way back 1990, he said, act like the person you want to become. How do you act? That's the body moving into action. How do you act like the person you want to become? You consciously choose the idea, you get emotionally involved, and then that idea is expressed with and through the body. You act like the person. So you've got to get emotionally involved with the idea. You see yourself as that person. You start acting like that person. Well, that's what auto-suggestion is. It's a suggestion from yourself to yourself. It's a powerful concept, very powerful. Napoleon Hill wrote a whole chapter on it, on the subconscious, on suggestion. Study it. It's very powerful. You're giving yourself suggestions all the time. When you're saying, you know, I wish I could do this, I can't do that, I'll never be able to make this happen, you're giving yourself a suggestion of what you don't want. Make sure your suggestions are powerful suggestions and they're positive. Get rid of the negative. We don't want that. Okay? Positive. It's a suggestion to originate in your conscious mind, something you see yourself doing, you get emotionally involved and do it. And practice it over and over and over. Now stop and watch, maybe watch your television. Your, there's some very good acting on television now. Um, uh, I, was, I just had a text last, I got it last night, I just saw it this morning, from Jamie Lunar, a, a great actress. And, uh, and she, um, um, she, she's a phenomenal actress. She came to the seminars, I got to know her, but, and, and I got studying acting. I was studying it before I met her, but I got studying it from a point of improvement. And it's such a phenomenal concept. You, you watch the actors, um, they're acting. They're not living, they're, they're literally living the part. But somebody writes a script, gives it to them, they read it, they reread it, they reread it, they internalize it, and they become it. And they act the script. Well, that's what you want to do with your life. Shakespeare said the whole, all of life's a stage. Well, become the person you want. Build the picture and then get emotionally involved. Start to act like you're already that person. See yourself as that person. See yourself as that person. And you can do it. That's how I started speaking. I am, um, my, my true nature, my real nature is I'm a fairly shy, quiet person. I'm very introverted actually. A lot of people wouldn't believe that, but that's really the way I am. And I had studied a lot of this and, and I really understood it well. But, and I wanted to teach it, that's really what I wanted to do. But I was, you know, I wouldn't ask a question if there was a dozen people there. Well, one day I was at the O'Hare Hyatt and I saw Bill Gove and he was speaking. This guy, Bill Gove, I think was the best of the best. And he had a microphone in his hand and he's talking to the audience. He said, if I want to be free, I've got to be me. Not to me, I think you think I should be. Not to me, I think my kids think I should be. Not to me, I think, the audience thinks I should be. If I want to be free, I got to be me. Now he said, I better know who me is. And I'm watching, I'm thinking, my God, this guy's so good. If only I could do that. Now, let me digress for a moment. I have listened to a tape of Earl Nightingale's on the magic word probably 10,000 times, over and over and over. On the magic word, he says, now right here we come to a rather strange fact. We tend to minimize the things we can do, the goals we can reach, and for some equally strange reason, we think other people can do things that we cannot. He says, I want you to understand that's not true, that you've got deep reservoirs of talent and ability within you. Now, if you'd ask me, do you understand that? I'd say, of course I understand it. But here I am, in the back of the room at the O'Hare Hyatt, watching Bill Gove and thinking, if only I could do that. And all of a sudden, that record started to play in my head. Now, right here, we come to a rather strange fact. I thought, damn, that's what it all means. If Gove can, Bob can. And I made up my mind I was going to do what Gove was doing, and I was going to get him to teach me. And that's exactly what I did. And Bill Gove became a mentor of mine. I didn't know him then. But I went and introduced myself. I got to know him. 
I paid him a lot of money on different occasions just to sit down and talk to him. Now, I don't speak, when I'm speaking, I don't speak anything like Bill Gove. What Bill Gove did was taught me to be perfectly comfortable in front of 1,000, 10,000, 20, 50,000. Doesn't matter how many people, be comfortable. That's what I learned from him. That was the idea I got in my conscious mind that I got emotionally involved with that I started to act on. And that's how it worked. And that's how it'll work for you and that's how it'll work for everybody. Thanks, Scott. Next question. This next question, Bob, is where does procrastination come from and how can we overcome it? <laughs> that's a real good question. I got a perfect answer for you. He wrote an entire chapter in here on decision. Procrastination is the opposite of the decision. If you take the book Think and Grow Rich and do this with somebody else, start reading the chapter on decision every day for 60 days. Every day. So you'd start reading with another person. Now the other person doesn't have to be in the room with you. They could be on the other side of the country. I have all kinds of people, thousands of people doing this. Where they start, and let's suppose I'm reading with you. I would read maybe 10, 20 lines and then I'll say pass. You pick it up and you start reading where I left off. You read maybe 10, 20, 30 lines and then you say pass. I pick it up and I start reading. So even when you're reading, I'm reading. And when I'm reading out loud, you're reading. You're mentally reading. So you stay with me. We read the chapter on decision. It's the longest chapter in the book. It's one of the most important chapters in the book. Decision is something most people never learn how to do. And that is because our parents make decisions for us, and then when we go to leave home, we don't know how to make decisions. I never made decisions for my children, never. They made their own decisions. They kept saying, oh, come on, well, what are you thinking? I said, no, I can't tell you. So what do you think? I got them to make the decisions. Decision is the opposite of procrastination. If you're putting things off, it's because you're not making decisions. Read that with someone every day for 60 days. I'll guarantee you'll stop procrastinating. Next one. I feel like there's a slight difference between the art of manifesting versus the art of allowing. Is there a difference between the two and do they have the same purpose? I don't see them as the same thing at all, really. <clears throat> um, I'll allow you to be the way you are, Mikey. I'm not giving you permission. I'm just not going to let the things that could bother me about your personality bother me. I allow you to be that way. Now you say, well, who are you to allow me? I'm me. If there's something about your personality and you and I are working together, I don't give you permission to be like that. I will just allow you to be that way. You don't have to change just to suit me. You be the way you want to be, and I'll allow you to be that way. I'm not going to let something that could bother me, bother me. I won't do that. I'll allow, allow you to do that. That's where allowing comes in, as I see it. Manifesting is when you hold an image on your mind to the exclusion of all those side distractions. That image must eventually move into form. Do you know, Carnegie was the wealthiest man in the world back around the 1890s. He, um, I think it was 1908, he started to coach Napoleon Hill. And Carnegie gave Hill a very powerful concept. He said, any idea that's held in the mind, any idea that's held in the mind, that's emphasized, that's either feared or revered, will begin at once to clothe itself in the most convenient and appropriate form available. Now, let's go back here and look for a moment. Any idea? We can put this on the screen, Scott? Okay. Here we are here. There's a power flowing in, and we can make anything we want. So we build an idea. There's an idea. Carnegie said, any idea that's held in the mind, that's emphasized, that you're continually thinking about, that's either feared or revered, 
will begin at once to clothe itself in the most convenient and appropriate form available. Because if you hold that idea in your mind, you're going to get emotionally involved. This is the heart of hearts, by the way. And that puts you in the vibration. That idea begins to move into physical form or results. That's what's the perpetual transmutation of energy. Energy is forever moving into form. Well, you've got to hold the idea on the screen of the mind if you want it to move into form. That's when the manifestation comes in. I see them as two totally different things. Okay. Really quickly, I just want to mention that all of the links that you've mentioned have been added to the description, but you may need to refresh your page in order to see them. So all the things that Bob mentioned that we would give you or allow you to have access to are in the description of this video right now. You'll just have to refresh to be able to see them. And by the way, Bob, again, again, Mikey, if a person feels stuck, you know, this is a time and you think, well, you know, I really can't afford to do this or can't afford. Look at let us sit down with one of you. Let us sit down with you. Let one of our coaches sit down. We, we've got a phenomenal team of people. They've all been with us for years. They've studied my stuff inside out. We work together just like a hand in glove and have for many, many years. Let one of them sit down with you for 30 minutes or so and deal just with you and your problem. You'll probably find that your problem will go away. So the, uh, give the person an opportunity for a free coaching session, Mikey. Yes, Anybody. The link for that is also in the description. It says coaching session. All you have to do is submit your name, email, and phone number. Okay. And one of, someone on our team will give you a call. Okay. What's the next question, Mikey? This next question, how do you conquer loneliness? Oh. Well, this may sound strange. Take your mind off yourself. People are alone and lonely because they don't know how to develop relationships. You know, we had a great book in here, uh, Scott and Alec and myself, uh, the three of us um, got the book, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. It's an old book, but it come up and I started talking. I said, this is one of the best books. So Scott got, he got three of them. We all got one. I'm um, here just a couple of weeks ago. And Alec was asking me about it. Scott was asking me about it because they're a couple of young guys. And, and I said, that, that's a phenomenal book. How to win friends and, friends and influence people. You got to take your mind off yourself and put it on the other person. People are alone and lonely because they've never learned how to develop meaningful relationships. Fall in love with the idea of helping someone else. Take your mind off yourself. If your mind's on self, you're going to become very alone and very lonely. Put your mind on other people. You know, I really don't have a whole lot of time to be thinking about me. I've got so darn much to do. And I've got so many people. We, I mean, we're, we're helping millions of people around the world all the time. So we're forever trying to figure out how to get more done in a shorter period of time. I don't have time to think of myself. Now, I remember before I ever started to read this, I was alone and lonely. And I was also broke. So not only did I learn how to earn millions of dollars, I learned how to have meaningful friends. I developed a new friendship with a, with a couple, Robert and Kelly Pascuzzi, just a great couple. And um, uh, new friends. I, I like developing new friends. I learn a lot from them. And um, hopefully they learn something from me. So. If you're alone and lonely, you're spending your time thinking about yourself. Take your mind off yourself. Get Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, and make, listen, this is where, here, I'll give you, I'll give you a directive. Take your mind off yourself, make up your mind, you are going to introduce yourself to the next person, next stranger. If you're somewhere where there's strangers, just say, hi, my name is Bob. <laughs> this brings something really strange to my mind. I was at a, a cousin's wedding, oh, years and years ago, and it was, uh, it was out in the country, and I really, they were cousins, but I didn't really know many of them very well. And there was a bunch of people around the house, and there's these other people that are standing there, and nobody's talking to anybody. So I went over and introduced myself to this one 
tall farmer that was there, and he said, hi, I'm Bob Proctor. He says, good for you. <laughs> I didn't know what the hell to say that. So every time I think of introducing yourself to somebody, I think of that happening. But get to introduce yourself to people and start asking them questions. Get really interested in other people. Ask questions. Ask if they're from here, where they're from, how long they've lived here, what do they work at, how'd they get into that, how'd you pick that field? You know, get interested in other people. Sit down and write out 10, 15 real good questions that you could ask a stranger about themselves. You get those questions programmed in their mind. I'll tell you what happened. When you leave, they're going to say, that guy's one of the most interesting, or that one was one of the most interesting that I have ever met. And you haven't even hardly sit in. All you've done is ask them a few questions. But you listened. You listened to them. You got interested in them. When you're interested in other people, that's when you become an interesting person. OK? Next one, Mikey. This next question, what do you think of the timing from a spiritual perspective of the coronavirus outbreak? I have to say it's perfect. I don't think spirit ever, exp ever expresses itself other than perfectly. Now, I know there's probably a million people listening to me that will argue with that. Um, and um, the only thing I have to back that up, I believe spirit always expresses itself perfectly. God makes no errors. And although we look at the downside of this, the terrible side, there is another side to it. And we may not even see that other side in our lifetime, but I can guarantee it's there. You can't have one without the other. The truth is nothing bad, nothing good, everything just is. Look here, let's go back on the screen for a moment, Scott. What the hell did I do? I've done it wrong. Fairly obvious, I'm learning something here. Scott, come fix it. <laughs> yeah. How do I get that? Oh, here we go. Man, just had to hit two buttons. But you got to know which two buttons you got. <laughs> All right. Now, if you go to science or you go to theology, they're the only two references that you've got to learn anything about yourself, science and theology. There's no place else you can go. You go to the scientist and you say, what is energy? They'll say energy is. That's it. If you go to the theologian, you say, what is God? I'm not talking about the person with the Roman collar. I'm talking about the theologian. They'll say God is. God is, okay? And that's it. We make it what it is. God expresses himself perfectly every time. Spirit never expresses itself other than perfectly. And spirit's always for expansion and fuller expression. I don't pretend to understand why this is happening. Um, but I do understand that everything happens by law, okay? Next. This next question, do you have an affirmation that would be good for the timing right now? Um, you can take that down, Sean. Um, I'm so happy and grateful. That everything in my life is moving forward in harmony with God's laws. That's it. I'm so happy and grateful that everything in my life is moving forward in harmony with God's laws. You've got to internalize that. Everything in this universe operates by law. 
Right outside my studio here, there's one big window here, there's a, I have a big Japanese maple tree. People are often looking at it because it's so big and it's beautiful. Right now, there's nothing on the tree. But in a short period of time, leaves are going to come out a very deep browny green. Then they turn green. And then they get a bright green. And in the fall, they turn to crimson red. It's the most beautiful thing. It looks like the tree's on fire. Then the leaves fall off. And it goes through the same process. And it's been doing that now for 40 years. I've lived here for 38 years, something like that. And it happens every year, by law. What's the next one you got there, Mikey? This next question, I am in your coaching program and my life has changed so dramatically. However, our teenage kids are so negative. We put your videos on in the background. We've tried getting them to watch your studies, but they refuse and they're lazy and unproductive. What do you suggest we can do? I would suggest you change your perception of your kids. And seeing them the way you don't want them is giving energy to what you don't want. And I would recommend that you don't try, first of all, force negates. It sounds like you're trying to force something on them. <clears throat> I would recommend that when there's a favorable vibration, sit and say, ask them what they want. You will never get anyone to change anything unless they're moving towards something they want. Find out what they want. Now, this may take a while to institute goal setting and uh, goal creation in the house, but find out what they want. If you have employees working with you and you're trying to get the employees to improve their productivity, you better find out what they want or you'll never get them to improve their productivity. Now, that works with children too. Find out what they want and then show them how to get it. Anybody can get anything they want, but they have to put the energy out to get it. So start to see them the way you want to see them. Take the kids one at a time and write down four or five characteristics about them that you really admire. Four or five that you really admire about each one of them. And regardless of how they're behaving, when you're thinking of them, you think of them with one or two of those characteristics being expressed. You see that. See a couple of these positive characteristics being expressed. Do not let their, per, their behavior control the way you see them. This is where perception comes in. Perception is very important. It's how you see something. Well, you are in control of your perception. You don't have to let their behavior control how you see them. You control how you see them. That's the way I would start working on it. Don't try and force them to watch me on video. They don't want to watch that. They want to see something they want to see. What would you like to happen? What would you really like to happen? Okay. Find a idle conversation, just wrapping with them. Okay. Next one, Mikey. This next one is actually a nice follow-up. Can my visualization raise the vibration of my family? Absolutely it can. Your visualization can raise the vibration of anything that's in your sphere of influence. You see, if you want to help people around you, the best way to do it is be a great example. Raise your own level of vibration. If my attitude personally is off a little bit, I immediately want to start working on it because I know that you don't raise morale, it filters down from the top. When, oh gosh, a number of years ago, um, our company had been struggling for many, many years. And a woman, a lawyer, came to the seminar. She became a consultant with us. And I started to get to know her. And I was pretty impressed. She's absolutely brilliant. And she had been a, a securities attorney. And she got more and more interested in what we were doing. Well, 
as the story would go, if I shorten it all down, she ended up being a partner of mine and owning half this company. Now, she, um, she changed the company like night and day. We're not the same company at all today. And the success we've had over the past 15 years has been due to the changes she made that she brought about. However, when she brought these changes in, she was not the most popular person in the world. And <clears throat> I realized that I was the leader in the company at that time. And she told me, she said, the only way I'll do this is if I have your complete support. I've supported her 100%. And now, she's won over the people. Now the people like her. They have respect for her. Because she's done such a phenomenal job. But I had to see everything she was doing. I understood it, and I knew it wasn't an easy thing to do. I had to see it as good and supported her. Because that energy would go out from me. If you want to change something in your particular environment, you've got to change you. It's like the parents were talking about the kids. Change your perception of the kids. Change how you're treating the kids, how you're talking to the kids. Don't try and force something on. Force negates. And I knew that if we were going to change the company, I had to change. I had to support what she was doing 100%. And Sandy Gallagher literally changed the Proctor Gallagher Institute. That's when it became the Proctor Gallagher Institute. It had been Life Success Productions up to that time. She made a phenomenal difference over the past 10, 15 years. And so we're coming near the end of this. I wanted to take a time towards the end of this is to thank Sandy. And uh, she, would, uh, she would be here only the border's closed and she can't come in. I'm in Canada and um, she's in America. But she has done a phenomenal job and I want to publicly thank her for the job she's done. we got time for a couple more questions, I think. Mikey? All right, here's the next one. If I get mentored by you and do exactly what you tell me, how dramatic will my results change and how do I know if this is the right time to be mentored? You do exactly what I tell you. Your results will change like night and day. You see, when I, when I um, started to read this book, I was earning $4,000 a year and I owed $6,000. Um, I had never had a good work record in my life, ever. I, have, um, I sat down one day, I wrote on a piece of paper, I'm going to build a company that operates all over the world. We have uh, consultants now operate in over 85 countries. I think it's 88 countries. When we stream, we'll stream into 120 countries. We uh, reach millions of people. How did that happen? It happened because I did exactly what my mentor told me. He said, if you do exactly what I tell you. I have coached a woman in Germany, Catherine, and um, I think she's earned up to a million in a week. Um, it only makes sense. I was working with the Prudential. Let me digress. I was working with the Prudential. I worked with all of the Prudential. We raised the sales by hundreds of millions of dollars way back in the 70s. And at the uh, first meeting, there was um, 450 of their agents at the Hillside Holiday Inn in Chicago. Ron Sempertrain was the number one agent that year, 1972, I think it was, he was the number one agent in the world with the Prudential. There was 450 agents in the room. At one point, I found out Ron was in the room, and I asked him, I said, Ron, how many people in the past year have uh, asked you if they could take you out for lunch or breakfast with a half a dozen well-prepared questions? Not one. None. No one had. That is not uncommon. We will find that um, people that are not winning they don't go to people that are winning and ask them exactly what to do. Well, when Ray Stanford gave me this, he said, if you do exactly what I tell you, I'll show you how to get anything you want. Now, I didn't believe that, but I believed he believed it. And I don't know why, but I made up my mind I'd do exactly what he told me. Now, I've had four or five mentors. I went from him to uh, Earl Nightingale and Lloyd Conant, Val Van Der Waal, Bill Gove. And I've done exactly what they said. Even if I didn't agree, I would do it. My life is so different, it's different night and day. There's no comparison. If you're going to be coached by somebody, do exactly what they tell you. 
first of all, if I was coaching you didn't do what I told you, I would fire you because I'd be wasting my time and wasting yours, and I don't want to do that. You see, the sand is ultimately going to run out for every one of us. We don't know when. We do know that we're here now. And it would only be prudent to make damn sure that we're doing what we can right now to be as productive as we can. I see, um, I had a short letter, and I have not answered it yet, from Chris Guerrero. Um, Chris Guerrero wrote me a letter, gosh, it's going back 25 years. I think it was 25 years. He, he wrote me a letter just recently, and he, uh, he came to our coaching program. Um, uh, 20, 20, 25 years ago. And then after he went through it, he said, you know, he wrote me a letter. And he said, Bob, I had to put two or three credit cards together to go through your program. But I want you to know I've just had my first million dollar month. Now that was 20 years ago. He wrote me a letter here just within a few months, a couple of months ago. He's earned millions of dollars. Started in one with many, many countries or companies all over the world. He started, he was broke. I've seen that happen time and time again. Bruce Payata, young man here in Toronto. I've watched him grow multi-millions of dollars. If you're going to be coached, do exactly what the coach tells you until you find out they're lying or they don't know what they're talking about. I will not lie to you, and I do know what I'm talking about. If you want help, let us give you help. I've offered you a free coaching program. Take advantage of it, for goodness sake. Don't stay stuck. Don't get locked into what we're hearing on the papers or hearing on the news and on the radio and everything. You've got to get locked into some heavy studying now. Protect yourself. And you protect yourself by keeping your mind in the right space. God gave you more talent and ability than you'll ever hope to use in this lifetime. Your gift to God is to utilize as much of that talent and ability as you can in this lifetime. No one knows what we're capable of doing. No one. It's our obligation to find out what we are capable of doing. God is good all the time. You've got talent and ability beyond the scope of your imagination. Don't waste it. For goodness sake, don't waste it. I want to thank all of you for, um, for your questions and coming in, and hopefully maybe we've helped you. And if we have, we'll probably start doing this on a more regular basis, open to the public. Um, the, um, the staff that I've got here working with me, um, Tommy Collier and Scott Edwards and Mikey Steller um, are all working with me on this particular production. They do an absolutely phenomenal job. We have, I believe, the best staff of any company anywhere in the world. and. Um, They've been with us for years. My own personal assistant, Gina, has been with me. Gina Hayden, she's been with me for 34 years. And we've got phenomenal, just a phenomenal team of people. We've got a great consulting program. We have consultants all over the world. And um, it's headed up by my daughter-in-law, uh, Corey Proctor, a phenomenal person. She was with us for five years before she became my daughter-in-law. I was thinking my son was blind at one point. But at any rate. Uh, we've got a tremendous team of people, and uh, I want to thank all of them. I want to thank the three I just mentioned, Scott and Tommy and uh, Mikey, for this production. And I look forward to seeing you in the very near future. For God's sake, hold the image of what you want in your mind. Don't spend a second thinking of what you don't want. God's gift to you, more talent and ability than you'll ever hope to use in your lifetime. Your gift to God is to develop as much of it as you can in this lifetime. This is Bob Proctor. Thank you.